checking the recording. So uh, you are all being recorded. Let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share a presentation. And by the way, I'll just say um, for everyone who's not actually talking, if you could mute yourself, uh, you'll have a control in the lower left-hand part of the screen to mute. That'll help make sure we don't get any feedback loops going. And then when it's time to talk, of course, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, so sharing. I'll share this screen right here. And you should see the PowerPoint presentation. Somebody jump in and say they've got the PowerPoint in view. Yes, I have it in view. Yeah, okay, good. So here's our statewide uh, pilot briefing for May 13th. Tonight, um, this ended up being a little bit longer than I thought it would be. So I'd like everybody to sit through the first two parts where we go through um, uh, a uh, background for CalDART and we go through exercise details. Uh, and then the second part, utilizing general aviation and disaster response and CalDART deployments, that'll be optional. So if anybody wants to check off at the beginning of that or any time through it, uh, my feelings won't be hurt. Probably overall, we're looking at about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, so that's what we'll cover. And by the way, I just got a call from Stephen Tucker. So um, I'm wondering if somebody who knows Stephen can give him a hand. He may be having trouble getting into the um, meeting tonight. And of course, I can't handle that online. Uh, so that's what we'll cover. Um, and Dale Blodgett, if you're on, I believe you have access to Stephen's phone number. You could give him a call and give him a hand on how to uh, to get in. Okay, yeah, I'll give him a call. Thank you. Okay, so we put an ad hoc DART disaster airlift response team together for this exercise. We don't have a DART defined for the state. All 350 of our members and friends and, and uh, are all part of this uh, DART. And we just pick who's ever available for particular exercise. So for this particular state exercise, it's me doing the incident command. Dean McCauley has been doing phenomenal mass outreach for us. And we are getting backed up by some phenomenal people. Uh, Darren Kent um, from Civil Air Patrol who helped out on San Bernardino. Bill Blodgett, who's just been doing an amazing amount of time responding to all of our 160 people who inquired. Luis Mateos, who's another Civil Air Patrol person uh, and an expert in planning, and Mary Bromwich, who's uh, been with us uh, on a couple different Santa Barbara um, uh, missions we've done over the years, uh, making flights from uh, source by direct relief. So that's our ad hoc uh, DART. We're putting it all together. A little bit of the background about CalDART. So our mission statement is that we organize California pilots and ground personnel to provide volunteer disaster air transportation services to benefit communities experiencing a major earthquake, flood, or other disaster. And this particular picture here is on the tarmac at San Bernardino. Wes Klein is uh, taking off for a flight there. Uh, and I forget the pilot who's on the ground. I'd like to go ahead and play a video to go along with this at this time. I'll change my share, screen two, and we'll go ahead and get the video rolling. Natural disasters of all kinds strike California daily, and when they do, lives are threatened, property is destroyed, and immediate help is on its way. Or is it? Emergency officials say that in any disaster, you're on your own for the first 72 hours and life-sustaining supplies, shelter, and hope are essential to survival. When a disaster strikes, CalDART flies into action by providing life-saving services on a moment's notice. We are a California-based volunteer nonprofit organization fully supported by viewers like you. We need your help to volunteer, to donate your time and express your generosity and to spread the word throughout your communities in California that we will always be there when you need us most. The California Disaster Airlift Response Team Network is comprised of skilled volunteer pilots 
who utilize their experience, personal equipment, and aircraft to transport critical supplies and personnel many miles, or the last mile, between the disaster area and local airports in the disaster zone. Our CalDART operators are located in communities and airports around the state, growing in number and proficiency year by year. They conduct annual readiness exercises, working with local organizations that assist during disasters to prepare for the logistical issues that could arise in an emergency. Volunteer pilots, ground support, and your financial contributions are essential to help us assist you and your neighbors throughout California during a crisis. We are a necessity in your community's lifeline during an emergency. We are CalDART. For additional information on what we do and how you can contribute to our cause, go on. Okay, so that's our CalDART video. Thank you, Ronald Levick, for a masterful job of producing that a couple of years ago and sourcing the talent that did it for us. And by the way, the people who just came in, uh, I muted you, and Stephen Tucker did get in, so that's good. Uh, when you're ready to talk, you'll need to unmute yourself. Um, so that's our CalDAR background video, give you a good sense of what we do. Um, so what is CalDAR leverage? We've got 26,000 planes in California, 54,000 pilots, and a whole bunch of airports, um, and a lot of people want to volunteer in a time of disaster. So our role is to be ready and practiced and to have all kinds of connections around the state to make it easier to plug in would-be aviation volunteers to uh, disaster response needs. A little bit about our status. You'll see the red dots in the state of California. This is Northern California on this side, Southern California on this side. Let me go ahead and go back into presentation mode. Uh, come on, you can do it. So this is Southern California on this side. Uh, we have the red dots represent the location of the hey, darts. Paul, Paul, I'm still seeing that video, the um, browser Thank page. You. Thank you, David. I'll get it switched. Okay, here we go. Here's the map. Now you see it, right? Right. Thumbs up from David. Okay, so we've got... 13 California darts, uh, 63 airports that have dart people. And you notice uh, a whole lot of people don't have a dart at their airport. So we would like to start more darts around the state. Uh, that's the nucleus of where our annual exercises happen, where people learn the skills that allow us to plug pilots in during disaster. So a little bit about uh, the CalDART organization. We have a board of directors of eight people. The corporation itself is a 501c3 uh, incorporated here in California. Uh, DART leaders uh, of these individual 13 darts you saw, we have 11 people in the 13 darts. And that's um, a little bit of a, of a action item for us And the two of our darts, North Bay Dart and Torrance Dart don't have active leaders at the moment and they're shortly going to go non-current. So we need to develop a new leadership team there. Um, so each DART has an annual exercise to maintain currency. You can miss a year, but if you miss two years, now you're no longer current. And you have to go through a recertification if you want to uh, get your current status again. Um, the uh, DART core group, um, that would be the managers and the pilots who fly in scheduled exercises, they're all required to be current members of CalDART. Um, so annual exercise is a great time to remind people to re renew their memberships. Overall, we have about 350 or so people in CalDART, uh, a few life members, Marielle Cueto, you're on this call, you're one of them, uh, many annual members, many annual members who aren't current in their dues, uh, donors and friends. Friend is a uh, is a non-financial relationship. They receive most of our communications, uh, but there's no financial commitment. CalDART's history. We were inspired by the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989. So let me just take a minute and change the share and look at that uh, earthquake. <laughs> On Tuesday, October 17, 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake was felt from Los Angeles to the Oregon border. The cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville 
each only about 10 miles from the epicenter, sustained heavy damage as collapsing buildings killed five people. The earthquake destroyed 200 homes in Watsonville and damaged another 1,100, leaving over 2,000 people in tent camps and temporary shelters. Highway 17 was blocked by a massive landslide and would not completely reopen for 32 days. A collapsed bridge closed Highway 1 at Struve Slough. Highways 152, 129, and many roads in the Santa Cruz Mountains were also closed, hindering access to the areas which most needed help. And although it could not run its own printing press, a fresh copy of Watsonville's Register Pajaronian newspaper was available the day after the earthquake, October 18th. It had been printed in San Luis Obispo and flown into Watsonville Municipal Airport. In the coming days, all of Santa Cruz County would benefit from the lifeline that Watsonville Airport provided to the outside world. Within 20 hours after the earthquake, military C-130 aircraft delivered a crew of Federal Emergency Management Agency personnel who would inspect and red tag unsafe structures and evaluate the extent of the earthquake damage. Subsequent C-130 flights into Watsonville would deliver emergency supplies and retrieve FEMA personnel. California Department of Forestry helicopters used the airport as they battled several fires started by the earthquake. Army Red Cross helicopters were based at the airport, ready to evacuate earthquake victims. The Navy also flew in two Black Hawk helicopters, carrying several tons of emergency relief supplies. To prevent further shaking of unstable buildings, the airport traffic pattern was changed to keep flights of these helicopters and all other aircraft away from the city of Watsonville. The terminal at Watsonville Airport became a staging area for FEMA workers, military officials and medical personnel. State and federal officials also arrived by air and the media followed. While the Federal Aviation Administration closed off Watsonville Airport to all flights except those delivering emergency relief, most incoming flights were still made in privately owned aircraft. Pilots from all around the Bay Area volunteered to deliver donated supplies to Watsonville residents in need. On Thursday, October 19th, the food bank of Contra Costa County asked Linda Maloche at Buchanan Field in Concord if several tons of food could be delivered to Watsonville by air. Calling on volunteer pilots, Linda organized an airlift that delivered 40,000 pounds of food in 100 flights by early Friday afternoon. Bill Dunn and John McAvoy organized an airlift from Reed Hillview Airport that began Saturday, October 21st. By Sunday evening, Reed Hillview pilots had conducted 300 flights using 80 aircraft, transporting one quarter million pounds of much needed food, water, clothing, and camping equipment to Watsonville. Everything had been donated, including the supplies, planes, and fuel. Similar airlifts were organized out of other airports. Hamilton Army Airfield pilots flew in 28,000 pounds of supplies in less than two hours using 50 aircraft. Pilots from Half Moon Bay and San Carlos also participated in the airlift delivering thousands of pounds of supplies to Watsonville. In the days following the earthquake, the tarmac of Watsonville Airport was crowded with unloading aircraft. There was so much air traffic that the FAA brought in a temporary air traffic control tower. The California Conservation Corps provided help moving the incoming supplies as five hangars were filled with goods destined for local disaster relief organizations. Ultimately, over a thousand airlift flights delivered one half million pounds of emergency supplies to the Second Harvest Food Bank alone. Watsonville Airport provided speedy access to the county hardest hit by the Loma Prieta earthquake. And when Watsonville needed it most, hundreds of Bay Area volunteer pilots flew in emergency supplies. Okay, so let's get a new share. We'll come back to the main presentation. Um, I was uh, working in a building in San Martin, or actually Morgan Hill, about seven miles or 11 miles from the epicenter on the second floor. And I, I remember that I thought I was going to go down in a hurry. So uh, that was, that was a, a very big experience for me. But at any rate, getting back to the story, um, in fact, let's just take a moment to stop, share, get everybody on the screen. We've got a couple new people. Um, 
if you haven't muted yourself, uh, please do mute yourself. Uh, I'm going to mute. Uh, there we go. That way we won't get any uh, audio feedback problems. Um, and then, of course, when it's time to speak and ask questions and such, by all means, go ahead and unmute yourself. So back to the share. Okay, so our history, we were um, first conceived in 2008 at San Martin at SCAPA, the South County Airport Pilot Association board meeting. Um, one guy offered, to, I guess there were two or three guys that participated in that um, Loma Prieta airlift. They said it was pretty disorganized and people should be organized ahead of time next time. So um, they uh, they thought, well, why don't we start some kind of a plan and 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 do it? So one guy tried it for a year and, and ran out of luck. Another guy took it up uh, the next year. He was a nuclear trigger engineer for nuclear missiles on uh, uh, submarines, nuclear submarines. Um, terrific amount of research he put into the project and precision, and he had a military background uh, with a military contractor. He came up with a very good conceptual framework, the Disaster Airlift Response Plan. Uh, and that finally got tested in a tabletop exercise in 2011. So 2011, just to get a plan written and to do it on a tabletop version. First full-scale exercise was 2013. Um, the following year, AOPA and Northrop Grumman granted a total of $15,000 to SCAPA DART, recognizing its contribution to the community in aviation. Um, we had a second DART in 2014 that was WEACT from across the hill, Watsonville Emergency Airlift Command Team. They uh, modeled their team after ours, although they wrote their own plan. And actually the first three or four or five DARTs all had to write their own plans before we finally got organized enough to have a universal DART that everybody could use. Um, and it's a huge barrier to have to write your own plan at 80 pages. So uh, that's a big step forward for us. Cal Pilots adopted DART as a program in 2016. Um, DARTs won the FEMA Community Preparedness Award in 2017. Now they give that to a lot of different people, but it's the first time we think that aviation was recognized. Um, Cal DART was incorporated as a Cal Pilot subsidiary in 2018 and then spun off as its own separate corporation independent January 1, 2022. So that's the history of CalDART. Now we're gonna move into exercise details. And by the way, um, I'll take questions at any time. I hope to break up the presentation. Uh, jump in if you have any. So, um, this map on the screen shows our status as of April 6th, which is uh, uh, almost two weeks ago. Um, we had about 39 counties signed up for the exercise as of that time. I think we're up to 43 or 45. Um, so we're obtaining one of our objectives, which is to go statewide across all of California. You saw on our map that we only have darts in a few counties. And as a result, we haven't really had very good name recognition across the state. When we go into places like uh, the Paradise Fire uh, or the San Bernardino Mountains, the local people haven't heard of us and it's a lot harder to get started. So we wanna build that awareness. Um, we also wanna build relationships, individual people in the disaster management community, whether there was city or counties, uh, emergency managers, offices of emergency services, police, fire, uh, or whether they're organizations active in disaster, it could be community-based or volunteer. We want all those people to start knowing people and CalDART and having memorable experiences with them. Um, from an organizational point of view, uh, this is by far the broadest thing we've ever tried to organize with 160 people requesting service, either as um, customers or pilots. So we're flexing our wings a little bit in that way. Um, and of course, finally, we want everybody involved to think that this was a worthwhile and satisfying thing. Uh, whether you're on the ad hoc dart or you're a pilot flying uh, or you're a customer that got visited. So that, that's the broad objectives. Um, so the ad hoc dart, how is it operating? Well, we've got a customer service function. Um, and pardon me for just a second. Get out of here. Over here. Good. Um, so we have a customer service function that does a bunch of different things. Um, 
statewide outreach. Dean McCauley has been taking care of that. He has software that's able to basically go out on the internet and look for websites for county governments, city governments, and pull down contact information automatically. And based on that, he's had a lot of uh, emails out and we've had a lot of response. Um, so we're collecting that those customer details, a lot of not only um, initial inquiries and then initial emails of response, but a ton of follow-up questions and a ton of details to be ironed out. Um, so we're confirming participation. Uh, we're finding the airport that's good to visit those people at. We're finding a place on the airport where a pilot can meet a, um, a passenger. Um, and then we're preparing a virtual shipment. Uh, everyone that comes to one of these uh, airports to meet us is going to get a virtual shipment of disaster supplies. Now, of course, that's just going to be a certificate, which I'll show later. Uh, and finally, customer service is coordinating with local darts because each of our dart has a service area. Some of those darts have given us specific instructions to hand off all people to them immediately, and they want to coordinate with them. Other people have said, nah, you can set things up and we just want to give you some pilots to go fly when you have the need. So uh, we're coordinating that dart by dart. Now, I mentioned we have a uh, virtual uh, shipment certificate. Here's what it looks like. This is basically something that customers were asking them to clip into their disaster response plan binder in the transportation annex. So when disasters strike and you've got somebody sitting at a desk who's never done this job and they get told to find transportation resources, boom, we want them to come up on this certificate, which is a real short and easy read. It gives our contact information how to ask for help. So uh, flight operations functions. Uh, this is the next function we're doing. I mentioned customer service for starters. That's working towards the emergency responders. Flight operations organizes the pilots and they, they get down to the nuts and bolts of what airport we're flying to and what special issues are there with airports and airplanes and pilots. Um, so we have also done statewide outreach with the uh, flight operations. We've done a lot of outreach into the EAA, uh, Sheriff's Aero Squadrons, uh, and other organizations that are on the internet. Uh, we're coordinating also with our darts. So some of those say give the pilots to us. Others are saying you can organize it. Uh, we're doing pilot intake, which is the famous CalDART process, maybe infamous process. We'll go over that in more detail. Uh, we prepare the airlift dispatch log. This is the master log of all the planes going out. Each flight is numbered. Uh, all the airports that that plane is going to are, are tracked. Uh, and it's what we're working the day of the exercise to make sure the whole thing is proceeding. Um, there's individual pilot flight assignments. Uh, some of you have worked with us before, know our aircraft load sheet. We have substantially reworked the aircraft load sheet to totally tune it up just for this exercise, and it's called pilot flight assignments. Pilot will be sent to from one to five airports, expecting something like three. Uh, we want to designate a backup pilot for every pilot. This is something we're doing in flight operations. Uh, experience has shown us that there's a fair amount of fallout on the day of the exercise. People have competing priorities that they didn't realize. Their plane goes down at the last minute. Uh, a whole variety of things can keep a pilot from being able to participate. So we're hoping to have um, you know, hot standbys ready to go. So for pilots who get designated as backup pilots, they'll only hopefully be going to one airport for themselves, but they'll get the flight assignments for another two or three pilots. Um, and they'll get those flight assignments many days in advance and have a chance to review all those airports and be ready to go on short notice the day of the event if they're required. And that also requires that they start an hour later than everybody else so that we have some visibility uh, as people drop out in real time. Uh, we want to confirm airport and people assignments with each pilot. There's a little bit of negotiation going on with that. Um, and so that's a, a very important handoff. Uh, requires skill both on the flight operation side and on the pilot side. And finally, flight operations will send an email of introduction to the pilot and customers, including the pilot's flight assignment sheet. So that way, um, now everybody will have the information necessary for that flight. So let's take a look at a couple things in more detail. Here's an example of the airlift dispatch log. 
we have a sample uh, flight number would be one. Uh, notice that we aren't carrying any supplies uh, and we aren't carrying any passengers. So this part is trivial. Everything's going to be zero for the weight. Um, then we track the end number, the aircraft uh, manufacturer and model number, the pilot's name and cell phone. This cell phone is very important for both the pilots and the customers because that's how on the day of the event we can communicate any changes in plan. Now, the um, we have the departure airport ID and then all the destinations, however many are there. Um, the pilot provides the estimated time of arrival. We won't provide that in, in um, flight operations, so that'll start off blank. And then as the day goes on, we'll also record the actual times of arrival as they make it through the airports. And that is if we can keep enough eyes on the pilots as they progress through their flights. And then of course, a very important one is the pilot home safe time. Uh, we want each of the pilots to communicate to us when they've landed safely at their home airport. Uh, so we know we don't have to go and, and uh, support anybody on a possible downed aircraft. So uh, here's the uh, pilot's flight assignment sheet. You'll see it has a flight number, a pilot's name, end number, cell phone for the pilot, make and model of airplane, pilot's email address, who prepared it in flight operations. Looks like I prepared this one. We have the uh, home airport, Moss Field in Novato here. Total miles for the flight. So in flight operations, they're putting down a mileage for each segment and then totaling that. We're asking each of the pilots to tell us how far they're willing to fly that day. The prize so far, to the best of my knowledge, goes to Bob Amaral, who's willing uh, and volunteered to fly a thousand miles. So good for you, Bob. That's a long day. Hopefully you won't have to go that far. Um, some more information on here. Um, as the pilot uh, provides an ETA, he can fill this column in himself and he can provide an email to his passengers where they can fill it in for themselves. And notice the first line at the stop is the airport information, including where on the airport you're gonna meet the customer. The second and corresponding lines after that are the people you're gonna meet. So it has their phone number and that's a cell phone number. So you can text them as well as their email uh, and what their organization affiliation is. Uh, and for us in um, flight ops, it's, this is the Regathon number, which helps us to keep straight uh, who was where. Uh, then let's see, we have Yolo County Airport for our second stop with uh, two people being met. One's in the sheriff department. One is with one of these dog groups. Um, and again, contact information. And then the third leg of the flight is uh, returning home to base. So that's what the pilot's flight assignment will look like. And as I said, this uh, substitutes for the aircraft load sheet, which, we've, uh, which we would normally do. So now we get down to the pilot responsibilities and this gets uh, to the essence of what this briefing's about tonight. So uh, pilots need to complete the intake process. Uh, we have our own process where we review credentials we also accept current flight status from Angel Flight West. We have reviewed their intake procedures and accept those as good as our own. Uh, Angel Flight West uh, pilots are also relieved of the duty to be CalDART members. Um, although I think that's less of a concern for people than spending all that time producing the paperwork. Um, next step, pilots need to negotiate assigned airports with flight operations. So we're gonna have come up with airports that we want you to fly into. So if you have a pressurized Baron 58, which weighs 6,000 pounds and takes 3,000 feet of runway, be sure you don't accept going to a 2,000 foot runway. Or if you have a 100 horse airport and we're trying to get you up to Tahoe Valley Airport, South Lake Tahoe, uh, you know, decline that one. Uh, we need the pilot to do review on their end and make sure that they feel they can safely uh, fly to the airports that have been uh, assigned. Uh, check the total miles and make sure they fit your needs um, and that the meeting place on the airport is clear and sensible to you. You might check the airport on AirNav and you might consider calling an FBO or calling the airport manager, uh, especially for the smaller airports to get a sense of how that's going to work. Um, so after you've done this negotiation process and flight operations is confident that they know you're going to accept that assignment, then they'll put that flight plan assignment together and they'll give it to you and your customers 
So everybody will have that flight plan assignment. After you get that, it's up to you to uh, do your flight plan and with estimated times of arrival, include, including when you wanna leave that Saturday. And we would like everyone to be uh, planning to be airborne by 10 o'clock uh, if they're not a backup pilot. So their backup pilots uh, will have adequate notice if they can't make it. Uh, then we have um, the copy of the flight ops. Uh, yeah, so when you email your customers, be sure to um, CC the flight operations team so we know what your plan is as well. We'll update our records with it. Um, and then when you email those customers, get a response fast from them, back from them. Ask them to respond to your email that yes, they're gonna meet you at the airport. Uh, because just as pilots drop out, customers drop out, and you don't wanna fly all the way to an airport and waste an hour to find out that the person didn't even show up. So that's the first page of pilot responsibilities. Next up, this is a very big one. Conduct a safe flight for part 91 regs. So of course, you know it, it sounds so sensible, uh, but these flights are not urgent. Don't feel any pressure to conduct the flight. If you're late, you're late. Don't worry about hurrying up. Um, and certainly don't conduct the flight if you can't do it safely. Um, next up, uh, don't carry passengers uh, unless you've informed flight ops and you've got a CalDART passenger waiver signed and submitted to flight ops before you fly. Um, and that would include some pilots have a uh, right seat, uh, and that's great. You know, that improves safety of operations. Uh, they can either be uh, taken in through pilot intake process, which is more difficult, or by signing a passenger waiver and sending that in, that's very easy in comparison. Um, next, uh, print out a virtual disaster supply shipment certificate for each customer. And I showed a picture of what that looks like. You'll be the one to actually hand that off to your people. If you've got a three-hole punch, punch it so you can say, hey, just put this in the transportation annex of your binder. Next up, um, text message updated times of arrival at engine start. So nobody's ever perfectly on time. As you begin to notice significant deviations, let people know so they don't worry about you. And they, uh, if they can delay their trip to the airport, they won't uh, have so much wasted time that day. Um, when you get to the airport, you deliver the certificate to each customer and you text message flight ops uh, as you arrive at each airport um, and as you return home safely. So uh, we're gonna keep that status up to date and track your progress from airport to airport. Backup pilots. So here's a couple things about being special for backup pilots. That they should only get one customer, which gives them more flexibility to take on somebody else's uh, assignment. And I see David Mackler raised a hand. David, go ahead. Well, um, question for you, Paul, um, from those last couple of slides, like when to text and whom to text, um, is there some sort of a checklist that CalDART makes available so we don't have to uh, rely on our faulty memories? That's an excellent request, David. Um, and Dale, if you can take a note to that effect, let's, um, let's be sure we create a checklist for the pilots. Uh, wonderful idea. Thank you, David. And I see okay, there's some we'll things do. in the chat. Let's see if we need to uh, um, say anything here. So Susie had some uh, good points about being up on the mountain in San Bernardino. Okay, so back to the backup pilots. They should only get one customer. Um, they'll get the flight assignments for one to three other pilots. Um, they should study those flight assignments and make sure that they can accept each of those airports and that it results in a safe operation. Um, and then they should be ready to take that designated flight assignment if the principal pilot drops out. So, uh, you know, brief in the morning, uh, conditions, flight conditions, airport conditions for all those airports and be ready to go if you need to. So I mentioned we have a pilot intake process. Uh, number one is you need to be a current member of CalDART. So that either requires you to join uh, or to renew your membership if you're not already a current member. Uh, and then via reply email, we like people to say how many nautical miles they're willing to fly that day. Uh, many people haven't told us this, 
And as a result, when we give them their 800 miles, they might object. So if you can communicate that to us, we'll have a better chance of giving you something you'll accept. Um, so be sure you have your name and identifier of your home airport. Uh, that helps us uh, assign pilots to uh, airports that are close to them. Uh, in some cases, we have customers at those home airports and you can hand off your first certificate before you even get into the plane. Um, and then let us know if you're instrument rated, current and ready. So most people are letting us know if they're instrument rated, but it's also helpful if you um, can give us a little more insight on that. Um, some people get the rating and never ever want to fly instrument. And if that's your approach to it, please let us know. Um, and if you're a person that flies instrument commonly and it's no special change to safety of flight, uh, let us know that as well. There may be some airports with uh, Stratus, especially our coastal airports, and we'll try to have instrument pilots uh, going to the coastal airports. We're looking for scans of a signed and witnessed CalDART pilot certification and waiver. That's a three page document that talks about the contract of what we're looking for pilots to do in terms of flying according to part 91 and having insurance coverage and that sort of thing. Um, we're looking for aircraft liability insurance, minimum $1 million coverage and $100,000 per seat. There's a pilot and aircraft information form that gives us a lot of information, but for some reason, we never included the name and identifier of that home airport. So that's where you need to report that separately, as we mentioned above. Um, on the medical, we want to see your medical basis for flight. So that could be a medical examination that's current, uh, or it could be basic med. Um, we'd like to get both sides of your pilot certificate and both sides of your driver's license uh, or other government issued uh, photo issued photo ID. And um, and if you've already done pilot intake with us during the last 12 months, you don't need to do it again. Uh, simply forward us to the DART with your intake records. Um, and of course, the DART needs to keep track of their intake records and be able to tell us that, yep, we did pilot intake on that person and they passed. So, um, and then I think I mentioned this before, but current Fl Angel Flight West pilots can sidestep this intake process by contacting Troy Troxel, uh, who will forward your information to us. Now, there may be some other organizations out there with whom it would be appropriate to arrange some kind of a um, acceptance of flight credentials. Uh, it's been said, perhaps the Sheriff's Aero Squadron. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not familiar with exactly how uh, pilot acceptance works there. Uh, and we're not really able to proceed on that until we understand that better. But if anybody wants to step forward and contact me, I'd be happy to have a discussion with them on that from the Sheriff's Aero Squadrons. I think Michael Tirabessi, I'm not sure how you say your last name. And Jeff Morehouse, you're a man of all flying hats, I see. Uh, the, you are two of the people uh, from Sheriff's Aero Squadrons. And Bob Amarell, of course, has already completed flight intake with that group. So that's flight intake process. A little bit about ramp safety. All of us as pilots know about ramp safety. This is what we were telling the general public last week. Um, that the ramp is the area where airplanes taxi and parking. Non-pilots need to stay off the ramp unless they're accompanied by a pilot or a fixed base operator personnel. Uh, and in no case, walk or drive onto a taxiway or runway um, and stay well clear of moving planes and propellers. And there's a second part to this, which is uh, be aware of moving planes behind you. Once a plane is started up and moving and they're in front of you and close to you, they're making a heck of a racket and there can be another plane behind you that you may not be aware of. And that can be the far more lethal plane. Um, on helicopters, uh, approach them only from the front when the blades are not turning and obey any pilot visual commands. And keep in mind that the reason you don't uh, Approach the helicopter from the side or the rear is that those uh, propellers uh, and helicopter blades and tail rotors, tail rotors and helicopter blades can kill you. And the pilot can move the uh, controls of the helicopter blades and actually dip them down and chop your head off. So that's certainly something to be avoided. Um, and children must be accompanied and controlled by a parent. So let me take a pause here before I go on. I'm gonna stop the share for a moment and see if anybody has any questions they'd like me to address uh, before we continue.
Um, Paul, there's a, oh, hang on a second. Jim's got to turn down his volume. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a question in here in the chat from um, Herbert Herzog saying that he thinks some of the liability waiver requirements may negate his insurance or may be uninsurable. Can you comment on that? Yeah, um, liability, that's a, that's a sticky issue. Um, so we have three levels of insurance that cover liability in this exercise. We look for the pilots to provide uh, aircraft liability insurance. CalDART provides commercial general liability insurance and non-owned aircraft liability insurance. And hopefully between the three of those, um, that's enough to take care of any issues that the general public, uh, people who are flying with us, uh, or people on the ground uh, should suffer in terms of, um, you know, if there's some kind of an airplane accident or something. Now, in terms of the liability waiver requirements negating his insurance, um, I'm not exactly sure what he means by that. If he has a technical question with it, we do have a general counsel for CalDART, uh, and it's probably above my pay grade, and that might be something we have to handle offline and give to the general counsel. Did that answer your question, Herbert? A little bit, did. Uh, the, in, in my case, I'm covered by angel flights and, and, and their policy, so I'm okay there. But where we talk about uh, indemnify, uh, no, the, the, in my business, I wasn't able to indemnify anyone without negating my insurance. Oh, really? Okay. That's a new one to me, and I would appreciate if you could submit that question in writing. Um, with your insurance policy where that states that. And let's give it to the lawyer and have him look at it. I, I would like to do that. Okay. In my case, like I'm flying through angel flight, so it doesn't make any difference, but uh, I think that it may be something you want to look at. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, Paul? Other? Yes. Um, we could probably ask for a uh, additional insured for the insurance company to add Cal Dart is an additional insured. You know, we've been fighting that tooth and nail, uh, and the insurance company has been beating us up pretty hard to get it. Um, but one thing that makes us different than most pilot organizations, if you're flying with Angel Flight or you're flying with Liga International uh, or a whole lot of these other groups, you're a regular pilot, you're making multiple trips a year. Uh, if you're flying with CalDART, you might do one exercise every three years, um, and it becomes quite a burden. You know, it's one more hoop to jump through for just a single day's worth of work. Um, so we haven't had to do it. Of course, it would help CalDART's liability position, and I do appreciate that, Susan. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's just so difficult to get pilots to get that done on short notice for just a single exercise in a three-year period. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? Hi, Paul, it's Diane. I have a question about insurance from CalDAR for passengers or cargo. Does CalDAR provide anything at all for them or is it all on us and our insurance policy? Insurance for passengers and cargo. Um, you know, I think CalDART and the pilot are likely to get sued if there's a really significant issue uh, associated with a flight or an operation. And the pilot's insurance, uh, li you know, aircraft liability insurance and CalDART's non owned aircraft liability insurance, those are going to be our two primary force fields protecting us. Um, and of course, we're a volunteer operation and we're protected by uh, Good Samaritan laws. Um, but we need to practice in order to have be skilled. And during these practices, it's not emergency conditions. So we don't get as much leeway, as, as much rope uh, generosity on a practice exercise as we do in a real emergency. And that's why we're such sticklers on all this paperwork for all of our practice exercises. And by the way, I have to give Diane Gaskill the prize. Diane, uh, you were having questions about uh, waivers. And can you describe law back in the days of the pilgrims? I'm sorry, what was the question? 
Yeah, it seems to me you had a good analogy for lawyers and, and people who would be battling over oh. property <laughs> yeah. uh, back in the days of the pilgrims. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we picture a cow and there's two colonists. One's pulling on the horns, the other's pulling on the tail. And sitting on a stool down in the middle of the cow is the lawyer milking the cow. They always get paid, no matter who wins. Yeah, so uh, so there you have it. And of course, I hate to make fun of lawyers because I've been in lawsuits once or twice, and it really is helpful to have a lawyer to help you out when when you're in a bad way. So, uh, and all of us should be thankful that that profession exists. Okay, any other questions? Um, this is Dale again. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to comment that there are several pilots on this call who have not submitted any of their forms yet. And if they could get to that, it would just make our lives easier for doing the planning if we know they are actually going to be uh, on board. Some of you may be like Robert French, who maybe is going to be submitting all of his paperwork to Carol Munch, and that's just fine. Uh, but if you're maybe you're using this uh, briefing, you know, to make your final decision, am I going to participate or not participate? If you are going to participate, please get that stuff in quickly because next week we go to scheduling. Yeah, Paul, the Palo Alto DART has a uh, meeting on Sunday. We're going we're to do pilot intake. Very good. Okay. Yeah. If you get your pilot intake through Palo Alto Dark, that's fine. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to the back half of the presentation? I do. I was, my name is Jeff. I was uh, typing this into the comments, but maybe I'll just speak it. <laughs> um, how does Angel Flight West and Cal Dart coordinate during an actual event? I think I'm beginning to understand what's going to happen in this practice exercise, but uh, what happens in the future? By if, if I participate in this practice ex exercise, does that put me on a list or make me eligible or, uh, for, for responding in the event of an actual disaster? Or would that be something that I would expect to receive from Angel Flight West? Um, well, I encourage you to you know register with CalDart as well. Um, and the big win is not having to fill out all that paperwork on the intake process. Uh, if you're registered with us, you'll hear about things directly from us. Uh, keep in mind that you can be registered as a member or a friend, and there is no financial commitment with being a friend. Being a member is $45 a year. Um, and by the way, we have a fair uh, insurance budget, and we haven't uh, found a whole lot of deep pockets to pay for it. So all those $45 fees really help us pay our insurance. Um, but um, Angel Flight West has supplied us pilots on three different occasions. Uh, we've got an MOU that we've written with them. When we have a need for pilots, they let us know and they can put it into their system. Uh, and in this exercise, uh, they said two pilots had um, wanted to fly and communicated that to them. We've only gotten um, feedback on one of them so far. I think his name is Donald uh, Herzog or something like that. Um, so if you've given them feedback, stay on Troy Troxel, Troxel to make sure that he sends it on to us. OK, thank you. I haven't gotten a response from him yet. OK, well, um, send me an email after the meeting and I'll forward it to him. And uh, hopefully we'll get this thing off dead center. And of course, you need to be current uh, as a current mission pilot with Angel Flight West. But assuming you're that status, that's that's great. Primitive. Okay, so without further ado, we will move on to the back half of this presentation. I'll go back and share again. Paul, I have one more question. Go ahead. Uh, it's not likely that it will ever happen, I suppose. But if it, one of our planes gets stuck somewhere, flat tire, whatever, do we have any plan to go get those people and bring them back home? No, we don't. Can we make one? <laughs> well, maybe that could be the function of one of our backup pilots is uh, the designated uh, safety pilot. Maybe we should have a, the taxi driver uh, in each region of California. Maybe we can have somebody volunteer to do that. Good idea. Dale, can you take a note on that? Yes, I'm doing that. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Paul, okay. Paul Bob, Bob Amaral, real quick. Uh, when can we expect the, the in first instructions or when should we be looking for emails or what's the deal as far as starting this thing? Yeah. So the date of the event is May 13th. We've right. told all the customers that they will be hearing from us by May 8th at the latest. Um, so that's a Monday. Uh, so the week of May 1st through May 4th or 5th, that is generally when you should be expecting to hear from us. So that's still a couple of weeks away. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think we're starting this time, but go ahead and fire away with a question if you got one. Okay, so how do we utilize general aviation and disaster response? Nope. What is going on here? Somehow my, my cursor just went backwards on me, but I've got it figured out now. I'll just use it backwards. Um, it's always good to know how your airport can be used. The general public, um, for them to understand all the ways that the airport can be used in disaster, you should communicate to that to them when you see them and you should be aware of it yourself. So there's emergency preparedness roles, critical community access, uh, other aviation specific functions. It's a lot, I won't go into it all at this time, uh, but all of our communities need to understand just how valuable their airports are in the overall web of transportation infrastructure. So how does a DART add value? Um, Number one, when we have certain triggers, such as a disaster occurring, um, and that trigger is enhanced if surface transportation is impaired, um, and we would assume that the aviation system is operational. If you have at least two of those, then you can use volunteers, pilots, and aircraft to provide free emergency air transport services, which aid um, regional communities' disaster response. So that's where we fit in. So we fill in the gaps. You know, a lot of times when you're talking to a local DART incident commander, uh, they're gonna say, we've got it covered. Well, no, they don't have it covered. They, they may be making sure that every single person has enough food, but anytime you're in a disaster zone, there's a million unmet needs that are adding to the misery that the citizens are feeling. So they need to know they can't do everything and we can fill in on the gaps where they can't, they can't get it done. Uh, we focus on the early days. We find that governments um, have the hardest time getting going in the beginning, like we do, uh, but we seem to be a little bit faster many times. Uh, and then we poop out. So after we've been operating for three or seven days, our people need to go back to work and go back to their lives and they run out of gas money. Um, and by then, hopefully FEMA and the state emergency command and the rest all have it under control. Looking at different air transportation applications, one big one, which is classic for general aviation is food and supplies airlift. Um, here we have a local food bank that's brought their 18 wheeler out to the local airport. And it turns out they have customers at five airports in the region. And by aircraft, we can move those uh, food out to those five airports. So that sort of thing is, uh, can be practiced all over the world. We can move people. And there's all ways that we can move people. It could be emergency workers um, just with their local commutes. It could be disaster workers coming from out of region. Um, it could be um, when you have access and functional needs, that's the A, F, and N, that you have a plane with a cargo door uh, that helps somebody in a wheelchair get in. Um, families, when a disaster strikes, families aren't all together. They can be split up. It could be that the parents and children are split up due to their long commutes. Or it may be that you could have grandparents who are good enough during normal times, but can't live in a disaster area on their own. They need an adult child to come in and help them survive. Um, so we can help reunify families. Um, and finally, medical air transportation. Uh, a lot of people who are sick can be transported in a car. If they can do that, they can probably be transported in a helicopter and get out of that disaster zone. Uh, and if you've got a really bad disaster, and your emergency medical uh, evacuation flights are 
full and overflowing, we may be a air ambulance of last resort. We don't practice that in our annual exercises, though, uh, in that generally our planes don't have approved passenger restraints. And of course, it's federal regulations that people can only fly in a plane if they're belted up in an approved passenger restraint. So let's talk about evacuations with general aviation. This lady in the picture, she's a dialysis patient. She'll be dead in seven days if she doesn't have electricity, clean water, and a whole load of supplies. So she would need to be out of a significant disaster zone. Uh, similar situations for people who get daily medical injections if their medicines and needles and sterilization aren't available. People on oxygen concentrators if they don't have the power to run those oxygen concentrators. You have seniors in managed living centers. It may be that the managed living center can't get their staff into work. And if they can't, then they can't support their seniors and they got to get all those seniors evacuated to another place. Uh, in a big disaster, your local shelters may be overflowing. They can make deals with shelters in other parts of the state uh, and we can fly them from the disaster zone to the unaffected area where there's room to shelter them. We can help with situational assessments. And I would add here that this is really bread and butter of Civil Air Patrol and we should hand off this work to them if they're available. Um, this picture here was taken back when Oroville Dam was in danger of breaching and the Feather River was flooding at uh, tremendous rates. We can take local uh, emergency management staff up in the air and give them situational assessments and they can bring their police radios and radio back down to people on the ground what they see. There's a lot of different ways to use our airports. We have 250 public ones in California and a whole bunch more private ones. This following set of slides looks at how to use them together uh, to respond to emergencies to, uh, and to uh, use them in different ways, handling different uh, applications. The simplest is a one-to-one -one air bridge between two airports where the roads in between are out of service. That truck on the right was stuck in mud 53,000 dump trucks of mud was on the roads in between Mojave and Tehachapi. And these pilots here on the left, fortunately there were small populations in the area and with just a handful of planes, they did some of the most significant flying in their life. We have a mini to one air bridge where you don't have a ton of airports or pilots and resources at any one airport. So you get five of them together and they all help an airport in need. That was the Loma Prieta airlift in 1989. We have a many to many airlift. Imagine this say in the Bay Area as an 8.0 earthquake along the San Andreas Fault where the entire Bay Area and areas north and south are adversely affected. Uh, and you wanted to put the maximum throughput through your airport system to bring in supplies of disaster workers. You would do that by having a one-to-one -one air bridge for each affected airport to an airport on the outside in the clear. Here's a regional transportation grid. In a big disaster, your regional freeways may be down. And so you can solve the regional part of the puzzle by just using the airports as your regional transport hubs. They're like the train stations um, or the freeway exits in certain towns. Um, and then all you have to solve is the local uh, transportation issue. How do you get from the airport to your local destination? Here's one that's a little bit more difficult to envision. But around California, we have many pairs of airports where you have a major international uh, commercial service airport paired with a nearby uh, airport reliever. Um, and in that case, um, you would be able to, um, if you could open up a crosstown um, surface route, you could say use Reed Hillview in this one case as a regional hub to get people to and from uh, the airport in the region, bus them across town to San Jose International, and now they can fly anywhere in the world. So uh, other airports like that in California would be Los Angeles with Santa Monica and Hawthorne, Long Beach with Seal Beach, Burbank with Whiteman, Oakland Mainfield with Oakland Northfield, and Ontario with Chino. And before I go on, I noticed that Rudy Spitt had a comment. He says he has a friend and fellow Angel Flight West pilot who will be sitting right seat. Would it be best for him to fill in a waiver? 
Uh, is there a way he could be designated as a second PIC during the exercise if needed? Um, so from the CalDARP point of view, the simplest way to qualify is by filling out that passenger waiver. Uh, if you can get Angel Flight West to tell us that the other pilot is also current in the Angel Flight West system, that will be satisfactory. So, um, Dale, if you could type that message to Rudy just in case he didn't hear it, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next, we can upgrade a mid-size airport. So this is a picture of uh, Van Nuys's uh, flight plans that were filed during the year of 2009. And you'll notice functionally, it looks just like a major international airport. We have mid-size airports all throughout California, just like Van Nuys. Maybe not quite like Van Nuys because they don't have that concentration of locally based jets. Um, but we could upgrade any of those uh, airports to this kind of an application during a disaster. And one final topology to look at is airports neighborhood. So in the 13 years that CalDART's been holding exercises, uh, this is our first, San Bernardino Mountains was our first airport to neighborhood uh, exercise. Um, and it gets you closer to the neighborhoods where the need is felt. Um, and we find that airports are the best staging facility. We started staging at um, a community hospital, San Bernardino Community Hospital. Uh, but they only had one helipad and we were taking it up. So that, that begins to interfere with their emergency transport function. So moving over to an airport is a far better way to handle it. So that's uh, utilizing general aviation. Now I have a little bit more about how CalDART works. Some of you may wonder what's behind the black box of CalDART. So our flight mission parameters. We require all of our pilots to operate in accordance with Part 91 regulations. We have non-commercial volunteer operations uh, at no charge. So this is all volunteer. We use insured and certificated pilots, and these pilots are private, um, commercial, or airline transport. Um, the aircraft are certificated and experimental FAA registered aircraft. We focus on normal flight operations. So pilots are safest when they're doing the kind of flights they do in their normal flying. So that's what we like them to do. And the way we split the responsibilities is the DART ground crew and management uh, takes care of the logistics and the pilots take care of uh, operating a safe flight. A lot of people wonder how we fit into the National Incident Management System. That's the NIMS you see above. Uh, and that's a very complex topic. And so here's one simple way to look at it. Normally, our, our system goes vertically. So if you're an incident commander fighting a local disaster, you've got a unified command above you that's telling you what to do. And unified means that the sheriff and the fire department and the emergency operations system are all on the same page. Now, those people in the field are backed up by their local emergency operations center. They can ask the state for help or the regional operations center for help. And the state can ask FEMA for help. And there's funding and resources and equipment and all kinds of things that can go down here. But there's also a sideways connection on the EOC. And this is where we come in. Your local to local mutual aid, private sector, non-government organizational assistance. VOADS, we're a volunteer organization active in disaster. So if we have a local dot DART, this is where they can plug into the National Incident Management System is with that local uh, emergency operations center. Now, if there's um, if they can't provide the resources, then CalDART has additional statewide resources we can bring to bear. And if we need help, we can go to our uh, backup mutual aid sources. So I've already mentioned that Angel Flight West is one of them. Uh, WeGARP is a very important one, which is the West Coast General Aviation Response Plan. These are people in the state of Washington, in British Columbia, and in Oregon. Uh, who are standing up or have already stood up DART organizations with pilots uh, of the like mind and approach as we have. So in a really bad incident, many of them can fly down here to fly, and many of them can operate from their homes uh, to provide remote support. Uh, I'll also mention EVAC and the Air Care Alliance. Uh, the Air Care Alliance is a group of about 40 public benefit flying corporations around the United States, pause and pilots, 
uh, all the different angel flights, and on and on and on. They generally all fly with a public benefit approach. So uh, any of them can be our mutual aid providers that we would go to asking for support. Now let's also think about a business model. This model here is a little bit limiting in that if all we can do is go to the local EOC and offer help, you know, these people get really, really busy in a disaster and they have more things to deal with than they can manage and they just don't need more things to complicate their life. So another way to look at this is we go to them and offer them service and they get it on a priority basis if they need it. But we can do so much more than that. Um, we go to our partners. Our local darts have partners in the volunteer organizations active in disaster. We're members of NorCal VOAD and SoCal VOAD. Those are volunteer organizations active in disaster. People like CERT, Red Cross, Cadre, all the different food banks, uh, the amateur radio emergency service operators, all of them could have needs that we could help out with. Uh, and here's a really big one, social media and the media. Uh, in San Bernardino, this was like the critical thing that made that operation run. They had people there that knew the media and could get the word out how bad the trouble was, and the TVs and newspapers ate it up, and they put incredible pressure on the politicians and emergency resources to respond. And then the social media was critical for us identifying people in need. And uh, we're still developing our social media skills. We're gonna have a whole presentation on that in our annual meeting. So I encourage you to come to that. Um, but that was so key in the San Bernardino response to doing something useful in a timely fashion. Uh, and then beyond that, we can market to fragile people. So we try to have good relations with people like EAH Housing that operate housing centers all around the Western US that could go out of operation during a disaster. And finally, businesses and residents. We advertise free service to all and we prioritize according to need and availability. And uh, we've got somebody who's not on mute. Anybody have eyes on on who that would be? Um, I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment so we can get that muted. Uh, looks like it got muted. Thank you very much. Okay, back to the share. Okay, so um, in the majority of our cases, we don't have a local DART. So we throw together an ad hoc DART at CalDART. And basically how that works uh, is a request comes in for service. We go out to our DARTs around the state. And that's why it's so important to have 13 DARTs or more that have active and robust organizations. And we go to the leaders of all those and we say, who's in position to organize a response on this? And usually we get somebody that can do it and, and then they'll drive it and they may take volunteers from all over the state. And we find we can work pretty darn well together remotely from computers and the internet. Um, but in a big disaster, we'll have to go and be local. And that local can have a local component and it can have remote source people behind it um, helping it out. So um, CalDART sources of mutual aid, I've covered this item pretty well already. I'll just mention one additional item that this WeGARP is a uh, brainchild of Sky Terry from the Northwest. He's the Northwest EVAC leader. Um, he has terrific social media skills and was the one that got us connected to San Bernardino, even though it was in our own backyard and he was all the way up in Washington. Coordinating airspace use. This is a delicate area. Uh, and certainly an area of conflict for us in San Bernardino where we took some lessons learned. Um, but a disaster manager, if they feel their area is quite congested and has safety hazards, they could request a temporary flight restriction from the FAA. And then the FAA will review their request and compare it against their standards for issuing TFRs and they'll restrict it. It could be the airspace, it could be the airport, uh, according to the needs of a disaster response. Um, so the FAA has a representative that sits in the State Emergency Operations Center with the California Air Coordination Group. Um, and that's a person, uh, Derek Cantar is the uh, administrator coordinator for that. Uh, and they have a team of people that's made up of the Caltrans Division of Aeronautics crossed with Cal OES 
and they coordinate air resources around the state during disaster. Um, so CalDART reports our operating status daily to the California Air Coordination Group in a disaster zone. And that's why all of our darts are required on their annual exercise to send in that form 220 to the state. And we also ask them to send it in to headquarters first because very often people make mistakes. And of course we want those forms to look good when they go to the state. Um, so we'll attempt to coordinate with the local incident commander through the emergency operations center and the localized event. Uh, this is where we fell down in San Bernardino. We did our coordination after we bumped into each other in the scene, which resulted in a stand down for possible safety issues, which we resolved, um, but we lost a day of the event uh, due to that. Um, and of course, keep in mind that you're not only dealing with an Office of Emergency Services and an emergency operations center, but there may be political issues between a fire department and the sheriff and the county and the city. So not everybody may be perfectly on the same page and it would behoove you to uh, reach out to all of them. So let's look at some recent CalDART deployments. Um, San Bernardino Mountains, I've mentioned a couple of times, um, we had 37 flights in seven days. Uh, we started at the San Bernardino Community Hospital here. You can see um, Mark Carter's uh, uh, beautiful turbine aircraft on the ramp, the helipad at the Community Hospital San Bernardino. He's about to take off with Ron Lovick and go deliver some supplies. And I'll note in a moment of silence here for Mark, he perished in an accident about, I believe, two weeks after this event. Doing a normal flight, he did all the time. Um, so let's all think a good moment for Mark and wish him peace wherever he's he may be. So uh, and let's all be safe out there. And let's not take any safety shortcut when we're doing these operations. Middle picture here is uh, Michael Musio on the right uh, and Cody Bias, who flew all the way out from Utah. Um, we'll see a little bit more of that in the video shortly. Here's Darren Kent. He's one of our ad hoc uh, volunteers. Um, and he's from Civil Air Patrol, helping to load uh, helicopters on the ramp at San Bernardino Airport. Let me show a couple of videos. The first video was uh, created by Heavy Dave. So Heavy Dave came out from Utah with snow removal equipment. He also came out with a helicopter. And he has just a fabulous uh, video, which shows, which really captures the emotional distress and the amount of trauma that the community was having and that I heard through the phone on March 1st when CalDART decided to spring into action. So we'll get a new share going here. Most about uh, needing some volunteers to come help us haul stuff. And our goal is to go down there and A, shuttle food and supplies in the helicopter into the here. areas that need it. And more importantly, I think we're going to, to have- share and restart the share. Sorry, folks. Okay, start that share all over again. Forest trapping people in their cabins. An emergency closure order has been issued for the San Bernardino National Forest. Trapping people in their cabins, shutting down almost all the roads. The mountains were buried in up to 10 feet of snow. And grocery stores are closed after the roof collapsed at one of them. We're frustrated because we feel like we're, we're, you're out on an island and there's nobody there. It saddens me that we're in this dilemma. It really is, it sucks. You know, it just sucks. It does. People are frustrated. We need help, this is not a joke. People are trapped in their homes, they cannot get medicine. This is far beyond us and we need, we need help. We're gonna see the mud flows, we're gonna see the rock slides. Driving is impossible, and it's been this way for more than a week. 12 days now, it's hard to get food. We've been stuck here for two weeks. 18 days. 14 or 15, I, I've lost track. I don't even know anymore. Conditions are still life-threatening. There are 500 emergency responders, but those who live here say that is still not enough. Man, hey, God answered. Our prayer is just from you guys coming down the street like this. You don't even know what an incredible blessing this is, man. You're gonna start crying right now. <laughs> you guys are awesome. 
This is the story of the mountain communities of San Bernardino, California. Hundreds of thousands of people were left stranded in a state of total emergency. Our team immediately started gathering all the supplies, resources, and necessary pieces of equipment to provide relief. We knew that we had to go. This is the story of communities rallying together to serve and love one another. And of course, that's the helicopter that flew out from the helicopter and joined our operation. So uh, that was Heavy Dave's video, really nice description. And it's a worthwhile video to watch all 22 minutes of it. We don't have the time to do that tonight. Um, but that helicopter came out, uh, it flew Heavy Dave and his management team out to the uh, mountain, beating the, the trucks by about a day so they could coordinate with local disaster incident commanders. Uh, and then the helicopter joined our helicopter airlift after he delivered his boss there. Um, let me get a different video going. This is ABC7 News. They captured us on a specific day. Uh, let's see what they had to say. These disaster airlift response teams are helping mountain residents, many of whom have been waiting hours or even days for even the most basic supplies. Eyewitness News reporter Alex Cheney spoke to some of these volunteers about their efforts to help those impacted by our own, our historic snowfall. Loaded this helicopter up for him. Got a bunch of donations. Wes Klein took this video the moment his helicopter touched down in Green Valley Lake with life-saving supplies like food and medicine. You're trapped in your house, I'm assuming, you know, with eight feet of snow and you haven't been outside for 10 days, you're running low on supplies. You just want somebody to, like, you know, know you're there and come out there and, and give you some support. Wes Klein is a volunteer helicopter pilot for Cal Dart, a nonprofit that provides airborne disaster relief missions throughout California. Since last Thursday, they've made several trips into various San Bernardino and Riverside County mountain towns, flying over shut down and impassable roads to deliver much needed supplies in minutes instead of hours. We can depart here and be on the pad in 15 minutes. And when you have critical needs right where you need it, you can't, you can't do any better than that. Wes says the reaction from the mountain communities he serves makes it all worth it. They were so stoked when I landed there. They were just like, you know, like just somebody that actually cares that's not government, is not being paid to come do this. I'm just doing this because I'm my own volition that I enjoy doing it. DART will continue to bring supplies into the mountains for weeks to come. This community up there has absolutely been amazing. They've stepped up. They've really, really worked together. Uh, this is probably the best operation I've been on in 52 years. So that just goes to show you that all these CalDART folks, they really care about the communities where they bring those supplies, and they told me that they are ready and able to go when called upon over the next few weeks. Reporting from the San Bernardino Airport, I'm Alex Cheney, ABC7 Eyewitness News. So thank you, Alex. These disaster airlift. And let's uh, do a new share. We'll come back to the uh, main screen. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit about uh, the rest of that operation. Uh, timeline, February 28th, we first heard from Sky Terry that he was hearing significant issues going on in the San Bernardino Mountains and we should consider mobilizing there. Um, the next day, um, we uh, I talked, you know, initially for the first day, I couldn't believe it. I was uh, saying Caltrans will have this sorted out in no time. The next day I spoke with Lisa Griggs uh, and what she told me over the phone just blew me away in terms of how bad off those people were, how trapped in their homes they were, how fully shut down the transportation system was on the mountain, and how desperate their ability was to get food. So uh, we decided to mobilize. We spent the rest of that day trying to see how we could do a, um, a seaplane operation because they were on Lake Arrowhead. We thought maybe we could fly seaplanes into Lake Arrowhead. Um, in California, we don't have many seaplanes and they're all off floats in the middle of winter. And it takes a day and a half to put them back on floats. So by the end of the day, we've toggled to turning it into a, um, a helicopter operation. We had people on the mountains who helped us. People like uh, Susie uh, Newman Harrison, who's on this call, who's a pilot. Her husband's an air show pilot and she was in the affected area. She was the one with 12, 12 feet of snow outside of her house if you got on the call early. Um, they helped us uh, get arrangements at the Mountains Community Hospital and the San Bernardino Community Hospital to go ahead and have two initial terminals where we could take helicopters off and land them and transport food. Um, 
And so while we were doing this, the mountains, the people on the mountain were terrifically resourceful. And Sky, who's been in a lot of disaster responses, never had seen any group become this self-sufficient this fast. But not only did Caldart stand up the airlift, but the group on the mountain stood up a food donation operation and a food distribution operation. And of course, you put those three together and all of a sudden we're pushing a whole lot of food up the mountain and getting a whole lot of people fed. So um, second and third of March, Ron Levick was on scene, first day with one helicopter, second day with two. Then we stood down for a couple of days and that second day wasn't very effective because of the safety issue with the seraph. Uh, and then sixth, seventh and eighth, we started really ramping the volume up. And of course, by the eighth, they finally started clearing the roads well enough that it seemed like there was no special advantage that the helicopters provided anymore. People still had trouble getting into their homes, but the helicopters couldn't get to their homes. They could just get to some of the main supply points uh, distributed around those communities. And by that time, they connected all those supplies points by road. One big advantage of operating at San Bernardino Airport was all the ramp space we had, very big ramp space there. They also gave us this hangar, which had loading docks. Uh, we rented a couple of uh, pallet jacks from the local Home Depot, and we were able to pull food off of the food trucks and, and stage them for helicopter shipment. Here's a little video of uh, operations during the light time. We're making 500 pound pallets here for the turbine helicopters. We have the helicopter loads pre-staged. As soon as they return from their last load, we get them up the hill again with our pre-packaged loads. Just got a fresh supply in from this van truck here. So all that water was necessary because um, the communities had lost some of their potable water supplies, their water turned brown. And so all of a sudden they had a very urgent need for water. Here's some pictures from up on the mountain. This one on the left, that's Lisa Griggs. She's the one that first got Caldart uh, excited about responding. She's at the Mountains Community Hospital helipad. This is Cody Bias from Utah. He was the one in that video that flew out with his boss, Heavy Dave, delivering a load. It's probably Sky Park, although I don't know for sure. Um, here's, again, Mountain Community Hospital making a delivery. Um, and Wes Klein, you saw him in the video. The local fire people there, you can see their trucks in the distance. When he went to Green Valley, they actually closed down a roadway temporarily so that he could land there. And the fire department coordinated the road closure. We had a Humboldt County airlift. You can see. Uh, one of our pilots from Concord uh, making that flight there. Uh, he also came to um, uh, San Bernardino and didn't actually, you know, he didn't have a helicopter. So what he did was go up on the mountain and help shovel off one of the grocery stores that was in danger of collapse. So a very big and welcome uh, contribution there. This particular day though was Humboldt County airlift. They had their earthquake back in December. Uh, we had a very small airlift that was requested by the Episcopal Church Diocese of Northern California. Uh, we picked up supplies at three different airports in North, uh, California and delivered them all to Fortuna in the disaster zone. Here's the Dixie Fire from a few years back. This is the tall and the short of it. A local Cessna plus a CJ3, I think this was, uh, delivered goods through the smoke plume. Here's what it looked like inside the smoke plume. Uh, kind of ugly. You want to wear your N95 mask. Um, we delivered it to Reno, which was as close to the fire location as we could get. The Rock Indian Tribe Airlift. Uh, this was done over a period of about four days. This gal here is Serene Hayden. Uh, she's the emergency manager for the Yurok Tribe. This was a part of a larger operation done with EVAC on the West Coast, uh, sponsored by the National Tribal Emergency Council. Uh, which handles all the Indian tribes in the U.S. and their strongest in Washington state. Finally, we had the Oregon Firefighter Airlift, which has another gripping video. I'll go ahead and show that video. And Stephen Tucker, thank you. I was having trouble remembering Mike Grimes' name. A little bit of I uh, can't remember itis. Mike, thank you all for your service to Caldart. Okay, let's look at the... Uh, video for the uh, direct the Oregon firefighter airlift. 
Okay, let's escape. Response teams are helping mountain residents, many of whom have been waiting hours or even days for even the most basic supplies. Eyewitness News reporter Alex Cheney spoke to some of these volunteers. Uh, we will need one more. So URLs. Looks like I didn't get them all done ahead of time. My apologies while we get this one going. There we go. By 1,000 for. Five support your radar contact. Climb and maintain one three thousand. Flight five two seven. Runway eight kilo. You're cleared for takeoff. Bad news is so easy to find these days, and to see this group of men and women who just on their own, in their own initiative, in 48 hours, pulled together a pretty intense logistics operation uh, from pilots all over the state is quite inspiring. 40 planes, 23 of which are landing in Santa Barbara today, to either fly directly or ferry with uh, other members. Uh, it's just tremendously fulfilling. You know, the, uh, the fires all over the West have burned up uh, so much forest, caused so much misery and unhealthy conditions for people coming on the back of COVID affecting all 50 states. This is a crazy year. All of us participating today are really thrilled to be able to help. So I got a call a couple of days ago from our executive director in Santa Monica who had asked if I could take this flight. And the chance to fly your supplies is, you know, manna from heaven. We're flying medical supplies in all around Oregon where historic fires have been burning all across the state. And when we get there, we're going to meet a team at the airport in Eugene from Reach Out Worldwide. This is California conditions. We're getting this east wind and it's 90 degrees on the southern coast of Oregon. Absolutely unheard of. I don't think in my 15 years that I've been there that we've ever seen anything like that. It's just a really difficult time right now for all of Oregon. Reach Out Worldwide is going to go out and they are going to help you as soon as possible after a natural disaster, anywhere in the world. It's a lot of these supplies that you guys have brought up, they're going to go out to like some of these smaller camps that aren't maybe necessarily getting the attention, not getting the needed supplies out there. So they're going to help people. And that's what we do and that's what I'm all about is going out and helping people. Organizations like Direct Relief is vital into our overall mission success because without support from you guys and from supporters everywhere, none of this can happen. Okay, so we'll get that one down and head back to the main sheet. And we're, we're getting close to the end here, folks. I appreciate your patience. And uh, yeah, I, we've got everybody's email addresses because they had to register for this webinar. So we'll send links to the videos. And of course, we'll send a, a video link to this whole presentation. Um, Operation Medical Shield in 2020. Uh, uh, we did a little bit of everything in that one. Uh, before we get on to this one, just one last thing about the Oregon Firefighter Airlift. Some of you probably saw Mary Bromage come on at the beginning of this call. She's uh, part of our ad hoc DART um, for this incident, this year's incident, May 13th. Uh, she did ground operations for both of these uh, Santa Barbara operations uh, for the Yurok Indian Tribe and for the Oregon Firefighter Airlift. So Mary, thank you for your contributions over the years. So back to Operation Medical Shield. This was the brainchild of Ronald Levick, uh, stimulated by a person out of San Diego that was trying to help out the community uh, during COVID, at the beginning of COVID when there was no PPE uh, and there were no respirators. And so we actually went in two totally independent directions. We started uh, developing a ventilator in partnership with a maker in San Diego that we flew around the state to Cal OES for uh, evaluations and getting parts from Nevada and doing all kinds of things. And we also found this group of high school students that was building uh, face shields free of charge. And we delivered them to um, nonprofit organizations throughout the state um, that were delivering food and delivering medical services to local communities and suddenly needed to have a whole bunch of PPE that they never budgeted for. So it was a very successful operation and ran for a good six months or so. 
So that is it. And now we'll go to general questions. Let me stop the share and we'll get back to the full screen. So, um, and we're about an hour and a half in. So any final questions that people have about the operation or anything else? Hi, Paul, it's Diane again. I have another question. You talked about airspace coordination. What about radio communication coordination? I know CAL FIRE has their own frequencies and a GA pilot. I have no idea what they are. The only time I know what a CAL FIRE is if I look for TFRs on the map. But if we're moving things around and we have a real disaster, how are we gonna know where they are, or how to communicate with them? Is CAL FIRE, does CAL DART have some central communications uh, place where they talk to all the agencies and coordinate that with us? Not very good, no, Diane. And that's something that we might be able to do better in the future. Um, we are staffed pretty thinly. And so just doing the very basics of coordinating flights and having a safe operation uh, consume a whole lot of our resources. Um, and that said, in an operation like we had with the San Bernardino Mountains, we were basically the only ones there. Um, we could have established a local frequency to use in the mountains. There is a helicopter to go on air to air, a couple of air to air frequencies that could have been used, but our helicopters didn't bother with that. We did have, um, for the uh, landing zones, we had an accepted frequency. We used the Mountains Community Hospital landing zone frequency for their helipad as well as the Sky Park helipad. And, you know, if we, have to coordinate, if we have to coordinate with CAL FIRE, uh, the CAL FIRE's number of the incident coordinator is published, and if need be, we would give them a call and work out for uh, uh, airspace communications. Uh, on a related note, when we're flying on a CALDART mission, will we be assigned a spec uh, radio frequency and, a, or, and or a squawk code? No, generally not. Uh, you'll, you'll fly as a normal pilot. Um, there is a compassion code sign that is available. Um, and some people have signed up for that. We have it through our CalDART membership and through our association with the Air Care Alliance. Uh, typically, I find it easy just to use uh, my end number on my own plane. Different pilots have different approaches to it. Some of the angel flight pilots feel they get better uh, priority handling from air traffic control uh, if they use their compassion flight sign. Uh, we do have a procedure on how to do that if you're interested in using that. Okay, I generally put a flight plan and use flight following, and I guess most people do, but if, if they know and you don't, do we have a way to communicate back to home base where we are and how things are going, or is that even we do we, we follow um, we follow flight aware if we have sufficient staffing to do it. So there's a variety of places that uh, and we encourage all of our pilots to use flight following. Uh, so that we can see their planes on the air traffic control system. Uh, and then we uh, request our pilots to text uh, when they land and what their ETA is for their next destination. So that's that's how we maintain a status board. You saw that airlift dispatch log. We're updating the actual landing times and the, and the updated estimated times of arrival as they come in. Okay, thank you. Well, this group gets the um, Endurance Award. Congratulations on maintaining focus for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we'll get this video up on YouTube within a day or so. Um, and I'll ask one more time, has anyone got any special video editing capabilities? If so, email me and we'll put you to work. Otherwise, hopefully we'll get it done. Thank you all.